are fortunate enough to be joined by Rich Zioli, a host on WPHT 1210 here in Philadelphia. Rich, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Hey, Ryan and John. It's great to be with you guys tonight. And so, Rich, I want to get right into it. You spoke to Donald Trump yesterday in an interview. What was that like? Uh, What was it like talking to him? How did he come off? Uh, Just kind of talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, he was he was great. He was very low key. Uh, could not have been nicer. You know, really cordial. Uh, happy to be on the show. Uh, you know, he went to Penn. He went to Warden. And his kids, uh, Tiffany and Don Jr. and also his daughter Havanka, uh, they all went to Penn. So he's got a great connection to Philadelphia. Loves the area, and he was feeling very confident, obviously, because the poll numbers in Pennsylvania, as of yesterday, had him up by 26 points. So, uh, yeah, he, it, was, it was great to have him on the show. You know, it was, it was an honor to have him on the show. And we took notes of what we exactly took from that interview. We know uh, Donald Trump's stance on a lot of issues going into this. And we know how uh, he really, I found fascinating how he really harped on how much of a quote-unquote disaster NAFTA is and that the TPP will be worse. What do you think the GOP voters think of his stance on these issues for free trade agreements? You know, guys, this is one of those years where it's, nothing, the rules just don't apply. Um, There's an article in the New York Times today, and I talked about this on on my show, where uh, they went through a lot of these areas where they've been devastated by these trade deals, you know, where companies have left because of NAFTA, and they've gone to Mexico and some of these other places. And, you know, what, what the article found, the researchers found, is that in these areas that have been hardest hit by trade, these trade deals, um, people are going very far to the extremes of the right and the left. And so while normally I think Republican voters love free trade and they're pro-free trade, they haven't seen the benefits of NAFTA, they haven't seen the benefits of the, well, you know, they hear a lot about the TPP. And so so they're, they're seeing factories closed. They're seeing people being laid off. They're seeing other people get ahead. They're not getting ahead. And, and, and all of this is sort of boiled over now to a point where on the right, Republicans are moving towards Donald Trump because of the trade issue. And on the left, they're moving towards Bernie Sanders because of the trade issue. So it, it's, very, it, it's very interesting. And I wonder, you know, in a general election, are Bernie Sanders supporters who are anti-trade, are they more likely to come to the general if Donald Trump's the nominee versus Hillary Clinton? And I I think for a lot of them, the answer is probably yes. Wow. So that would be very interesting, considering when Senator Sanders uh, came here just a couple of weeks ago to the Leah Cora Center, uh, you know, there was actually even an overfill of over 10,000 people. We know Senator The line Sanders- stretched from the Leah Cora Center all the way down to Girard. Oh, it was quite Amazing. the scene. Absolutely. And he energized that crowd. And you talk about, I think a big story of this election cycle has been the supporters of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders running these outsider campaigns and the traction they've really had. Because going into it months back, no one gave either of these guys a chance. Right now we're at the point in the election where Donald Trump, and I've listened to you, Rich, you, you've stated that Trump's going to be the nominee. You're pretty adamant about that. And Bernie Sanders ultimately won't get the nomination, I think it's fair to say. I don't yeah. want to write him off just yet, but it seems that he's got more work to do than Donald Trump does. So you can really see, you you really can foresee that some of these millennials that support Bernie Sanders so wholeheartedly that they would actually go to Donald Trump? Or are you talking about a different base in Senator Sanders' support? So it's a great question. It really is. And I think that, yes, Donald Trump, this nomination is his. I I don't see this changing. I don't see him, by the way, getting the one, two, three, seven at the start of the convention. But I see him walking in that night very close. And while I do not think the rules should change, I think enough unbound delegates will be there who will want to be kingmakers, you know? They'll be kingmakers in Cleveland, and so they'll, they'll put Donald Trump over the top on the first ballot, or uh, an alliance will be formed between Trump and Kasich, which will put Trump on the... But there, will never, there won't be a second ballot, is my prediction. It'll be Trump on the first ballot. And uh, as, as far as Bernie Sanders goes, so those millennial voters you're talking about, if they're motivated by... Uh, social issues, or if they're motivated by an anti-war stance, they don't want to see a lot of interventionalism, Um, maybe they'll come over to Trump. But what I'm thinking more of are terms of the blue-collar union voters who are white, uh, they're middle, they're middle age, and they are living in places like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And they've traditionally voted Democrat because a lot of them are union guys. 
But they, they, but if Hillary Clinton's the nominee and she's been pro NAFTA, pro TPP, they're not going to vote Democrat. They're going to cross the aisle and vote for Trump. These are guys in their 40s, guys in their 50s, uh, even 30s. They're white. They're they're middle class. They're union. Their their jobs have been stagnant. They haven't seen people getting ahead. And 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 I think that's why if I were advising Trump, I'd say in a general election, concentrate on those states. Ohio can be in play again, especially by the way, if he picks a John Kasich to be his running mate, then Ohio will definitely be in play. But you look at how Donald Trump did in Michigan in the Republican primary, and he won in a, in a massive landslide, as did Bernie Sanders in the Michigan primary. And that, to me, is very telling about the kinds of voters in a general election that would vote for Donald Trump. And so you mentioned John Kasich. And so uh, listening to the interview that you did yesterday with Donald Trump and just other things, you think that John Kasich is the best man for the job for the vice presidency, whoever the nominee should be, if even if it is Donald Trump? Best man for the job is not exactly what I would say. What I would say, though, is that John Kasich uh, can help Donald Trump with a couple different things, right? Number one, he brings experience to the ticket. And Donald Trump has gone on record and said he wants to have somebody who's a politician as his running mate. John Kasich did, what, eight years in the House, I think, and he's been governor of Ohio, so he brings that experience. Number two, he helps with Ohio, which is a pivotal state for Republicans to win. And the last Republican to win Ohio was George W. Bush. So, in other words, Republicans can't win the White House without winning Ohio. They haven't in recent, you know, recent history. So, Ohio is a must-win battleground state, and John Kasich could help with that. And then I also think there's something else he brings to the table, which is 147 delegates. And so, if Donald Trump is short of that. All those delegates are Ohio delegates, so it's much more likely that John Kasich could control where those delegates go. And so if he were to say we're going with Trump, I think they would all be with them because they're loyal Kasich delegates. So for all those three reasons, I think for Donald Trump it works. It doesn't work for Ted Cruz if Ted Cruz were to be the nominee. But, if, but for Trump, I think it's certainly something that would give him a lot going into a general election. And so I just find this vice presidency thing whole – Fascinating. So I want to go kind of back and forth with you on it. Let's sure. let's let's kind of play pretend here, and let's say Ted Cruz is the nominee. What do you think of him picking Carly Fiorina as his running mate? I've said on here oftentimes that I think it could be a power duo that might put him in the White House. I want to get kind of get your opinion. Oh, I think it's a great it's a great idea. I really do. Carly Fiorina would be would be solid, right? Because she's got the she's got the outsider thing going for. Her. The business thing going for it, but ultimately, uh, she's a woman who can go after Hillary Clinton. And that really works to, to their advantage because whoever the guy is who's the nominee has to be careful about going after Hillary Clinton. It, it has to be done in a different strategy. You know, when Rick Lazio ran against Hillary Clinton for Senate in New York, he, he came across as this guy who reminded women of, of, a, of a dominant husband, sort of a domestic abuser. He walked across the stage. He tried to make her sign this ta- no tax pledge. It didn't work well for him. So we've never had a woman run for president before, so we don't know exactly what works and what doesn't. But, but Carly can go after Hillary, and there's no rules, you know? Yeah. Well, Ted Cruz may have to be gentlemanly up on the stage with her, Carly can be on, on, on the surrogate, you know, speaking list, traveling around the country as his, as his number two, and just devouring her left and right and demolishing her positions, her character, assailing her as a person, and none of that will be blowback for her. Versus, I think, if Ted Cruz did it, to your point, I think, you know, that people, a lot of people, women might get turned off, but when she does it, they won't. That's an advantage of having a woman on the ticket, for sure. Absolutely. And going back to Carly Fiorina, just the thought of her being on the ticket if it were to be Senator Ted Cruz, what would her stances be on the issues? Just because you go back to Fiorina, in my opinion, at the primary, I thought she was going a bit more to the right to appeal to the more conservative base while she was running uh, when she was a candidate for uh, the White House. And then prior when she ran for public office in the state of California, correct? Was it for the Senate? Was it for the Senate Carly Fiorina ran for in the past? Yeah, U.S. Senate. And if I'm not mistaken, she ran more of the pro-business uh, Republican candidate, not exactly the farther right. So in a general election, what would she mold her, you know, the campaign around that? We know Ted Cruz is the farther right outsider candidate that the establishment doesn't exactly love. Would Fiorina try to be a little more establishment? Would she run the more pro-business Republican campaign or would she go to the further right? 
Good question. And that's why you have to wonder if what she brings as a negative to the ticket is is, is too much to, to, to consider her. Because w- with her tenure at HP, a lot of people lost their jobs. Obviously, CEOs fire people, right? It's just what it's just how it is. Sure. And Hillary Clinton will roll out a lot of ads of people who lost their jobs because of her, and they will make her the bad guy in this election. And then you have two very rigid social conservatives on the ticket. And hey, I mean, I'm a social conservative, but uh, but they would be, you know, two pro-lifers who are very much wearing this on their sleeve. Uh, and then you also run into the other problem, which is he's only a senator. She's never held elective office. So while the outsider thing can help, you wonder if it's better for Ted Cruz to balance the ticket with somebody who has more government experience and who, who, can, who can focus on that sort of a record, maybe like a Nikki Haley. And I think Nikki Haley is a perfect name that you bring up. I think kind of the uh, the, the, the kind of rising star in the Republican Party. I wouldn't be surprised if one day she decides herself that she is going to run for president. I want to talk, kind of switch to the Democratic side now. And Hillary Clinton, if if we're presuming that she is going to be the nominee, which it, it looks like that she will be, what do you make of her possibly picking Elizabeth Warren as her vice president? I, I think that that could be Maybe maybe two women on one ticket. Maybe I think some could find too much, but also Elizabeth Warren kind of brings in that populist Bernie Sanders kind of platform uh, that she's run on in Massachusetts. And Senator Warren has yet to endorse a candidate, by the way, this late in the election, which I find pretty astounding considering Secretary Clinton has racked up every endorsement in the Democratic book, too. That's very true, and I think that Elizabeth Warren, her heart is certainly with Bernie Sanders. That's for sure. So, um, all right. So, let's assume then she is the uh, she's the pick of Hillary. Two women on a ticket is historic. It's groundbreaking. It is, is something that is the story for sure. But I wonder if getting a you know two older white women on the same ticket is the best strategy for them because you look at this Julian Castro guy down in Texas and he's everywhere now they call him the great latino hope uh, can 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 he be the young voice that bridges to the latino community and brings younger voters on board uh, who and and yeah you know the outsider progressive thing is is important but but then again, he's he's kind of an outsider who might have more progressive positions than she does. So maybe he can win those people over. I don't know. It, it, it's a good, from an optics point of view, having a woman and a Latino on a ticket is something that Democrats would salivate over, I think. Two old white women on it, and I say old, you know, I mean, two women in their 60s who yeah. are both... Um, Democrats, I, I, don't, I don't know if that's enough, because remember something... You still have to win over white male voters, angry white male voters who are going towards Bernie Sanders. Will they come for two women on a ticket? I don't know. I don't think so. I think you got to balance it out with having a guy on a ticket. And, yeah, maybe that sounds sexist, but I just think of, you know, blue-collar union voters in Wisconsin and, and Michigan and Ohio, and I don't think they care about two women on a ticket as being historic. If you're going to get the woman vote, you're going to get the woman vote with one woman on the ticket. Two, I don't think, gets you really anything else. So then let's continue the conversation about Secretary Clinton, uh, Clinton apparently vetting possible VP picks. So I'll roll a couple other names out there. Talk about who do you think is the strongest. Uh, I, I've been really researching this the past couple of weeks because, again, as we presume, as time's gone forward, Secretary Clinton just keeps racking up the delegates. I, I tweeted uh, former Governor Ed Rendell. I know you've had him on the program plenty of times. Uh, in a tweet, I asked him who would be the best VP candidates. He rolled out three names to me. Uh, Deval Patrick, he said Tim Kaine, and I'm not remembering who the third one was there. So I guess a couple more moderate candidates in the Democratic Party that wouldn't exactly appeal to the progressive base. And uh, someone I saw speak uh, earlier this year, uh, Senator Cory Booker from the state of New Jersey as well. Would he be an attractive enough name? So there are three names right there I'd like to hear what you think about. And uh, also, do you think that is it presumed that Secretary Clinton will go for a more progressive VP candidate? Or will she possibly explore maybe maybe she'll throw a curveball and throw another moderate or maybe a more conservative candidate to try to unite the country if it were the candidate were to be Donald Trump on the Republican side? Well, let's start with Cory Booker, right? Uh, Cory Booker, I think this is not the right year for Cory Booker. He's very much like President Obama in the mm-hmm. sense um, he's... Uh, a senator, he speaks really, really well. 
but he hasn't he hasn't really accomplished a lot in his in his life, you know, in his private life. So Cory Booker's got a great political future ahead of him. I just don't think this is the time for him to go national yet. Mm-hmm. So I think that um, let's talk about Duval Patrick, right? The governor of Massachusetts. No, Massachusetts, right? He's from the state of Massachusetts. Right? That's correct. Yeah, governor there. He, he's you know that's a very very interesting possibility. But yeah, he helps you with the black vote. He's he's young. He's smart. But Massachusetts is the state Democrats are going to win anyway, so I'm not sure that helps. Tim Kaine, uh, Virginia, I think, right? That is so, correct, state of Virginia. Uh, yeah, so uh, Virginia's a battleground state, so for sure Virginia would be, that would be helpful in having somebody like him on the ticket. But I, you know, I still think that this race is going to be fought in the Rust Belt, the Rust Belt of Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. So I would look to somebody who can help me win in that region, you know, we think of these elections as national elections, but they're really not national. I mean, if, if I, we could just right now, the three of us could look at a map and 45 out of the 50 states we can call without even a, a hitch. You know, yeah. Donald Trump says he can win New York. I disagree. I don't think any Republican can win New York. I really don't. But there are four, five, six states that are definitely battleground states that are, that could go either way. So when you look at it that way, and you don't look at it as a national election, but as but as a regional election, who helps you? And I think that this is really going to be a congested region of that famous Rust Belt of the manufacturing heart of America that's really been decimated by by a lot of different factors. But certainly trade has been the issue in this election that everybody points to to say why the Rust Belt has been decimated. So who helps her in that region of the country? That's the that's the million dollar question. And so now I want to transition back to the issues. We kind of tossed around some some VP thoughts, but back to the issues. Donald Trump saying his kind of keystone issue is that he's going to build a wall. It's going to be great. It's going to be massive. It's going to get to every time he speaks, it's getting 10 feet higher. That's too. right. Yeah. Uh, the former <laughs> the former president of Mexico, Vicente Fox, uh, criticized him and Trump said, oh, there it goes. It's going up to 40 feet now. And so do you think this is feasible? Like if he if he becomes president, is is though is there going to be a wall built? Well, if there is a wall built, I'd like it to have a giant mosquito net to keep out the Zika virus. So yeah. <laughs> that's what I would like to see on it. Just big old mosquito net on the top of the wall. Uh, is the wall going to get built? It, it would have to go through Congress. Congress would have to appropriate the funds. Um, I, I don't know. It, it's it's just too hard to say. I I think that this is one of those things that. In fires of the base, if Trump is elected president and he doesn't have the votes in Congress, what is he really going to do? Is he going to try to use lots of executive authority to force the wall to be built? Is he going to go back to earlier laws that authorize money for the wall, but, but not enough, but try to build pieces of the wall? I, I don't know. Will he walk away from it entirely? But one thing I do know is that immigration very early on was the key issue in this race. And the wall, in my opinion, is more symbolic. I, I, I know that in a lot of people's minds, when they hear him talk about the wall, they, they picture a real wall, brick-and-mortar wall. But I think that in voters' minds, they hear wall, and they think a wall that keeps jobs in America and jobs from going overseas. And, and in their minds, they think, if, if you can build a wall, this wall that will keep jobs here and not go to China and keep American products here and keep Chinese products out, that's good enough for them. The wall, in a lot of respects, I think, symbolizes losing American jobs and also having people come here who are dependent upon Americans who have no jobs to take care of them. And so in that sense, if you, if you, if you stop thinking of it in a literal sense of the wall and start thinking about it from this giant protectionist trade wall, which, by the way, is not a good thing for our economy, but if you think about it in those terms, that's what I think voters, when they hear him talk about the wall, I think in their minds that's what they're really thinking. It's a wall that's going to protect my job and keep somebody who's going to compete for my job out of this country. Talking to Rich Zioli here at 1210 WPHT Talk Radio. Some breaking news for all of our listeners out there. CNN projects that Secretary Hillary Clinton will win the Pennsylvania Democratic primary as expected. Shocking. Yeah, yeah shocker, I yeah, know. I mean, again, well, <laughs> like, like you talked about it this week, Rich, as I was listening, and I'm sorry that you were unable to get Senator Sanders today. I know he was lined up for, I believe, the 5 o'clock hour. But nonetheless, this was something, again, none of the results we're going to see tonight 
I think are really going to wow us. It's just it's what yeah. we're going to see moving forward. But I, I want your opinion, though. Uh, we, you just talked about Donald Trump and, again, the wall more so being symbolic. And he keeps harping on bringing these jobs back to America. Uh how feasible is this? And how obviously you look at the two GOP front runners right now, Donald Trump and Ted Cruz, all be running for the same ticket, uh, have such different views. In my opinion, there's such different candidates that even yesterday when you interviewed Donald Trump, it, it sounds like he he didn't exact Donald Trump didn't exactly say that he's going to support Ted Cruz if he were to win in the broker convention. So is there going if Donald Trump doesn't get this nomination ultimately, and again you think he will, and I think a lot of people do, but if it were to go to a second bail and Ted Cruz were to take the nomination away from the Republican Party, would that be a schism for the GOP? Without question. It would be a, a schism and, and the Republicans would lose in the general election. And that's because Donald Trump and his supporters would, would literally stay home. I don't think he'd run third party or run as a write in, but I do think they would they would they would stay home and millions of, of them would. Republicans would lose and then the Republican Party would finally break apart and maybe into three different parties. It's hard to say, but it, it it's going to happen at some point. The Republican Party has so many different factions within it. You've got the libertarians, you've got the social conservatives, you obviously have the Reagan Democrats who have now crossed over. It's, it's, the old saying is the big tent, but this tent is, is just burgeoning at the seams. And I had Dana Perino on with me uh, about a week or two ago, and I asked her, and I said, is, is this primary, if, if that scenario you just outlined happens, is that the end of the Republican Party as we know it? And she said, either way, I think the Republican Party as we know it is done. And the reason for that is because even if Trump gets the nomination on the first ballot, you have this giant never-Trump movement that's out there. There's a possibility they may not vote. Uh, there's a possibility a lot of Cruz supporters stay home. So either way, the party may, in fact, be permanently damaged. And I think the only way you bring the party back together is if you have something to rally against, not for, but against. And that may be, if Hillary Clinton is the nominee, that may be enough to bring everybody back together to try to stop her. But may not be enough. I don't know. Was the Never, Tr- uh, st- uh, the Never Trump movement ultimately hurting the Republican Party then? It, it seems like you have... In the Democratic race, albeit it, it's it's nasty, like I think a lot of the national attention has gone towards the Republican uh, primary being so nasty with the personal tax. Yeah. Although the Democratic Party has had their fair share of uh, real blows to each other, that it, it's gotten. I think every election, in its essence, has to be a bit nasty. And ultimately, is this never stop uh, with the Never Trump movement? Is it ultimately going to hurt the Republican Party? Because it seems a bit counterintuitive right. that you know you're you're going so against the one candidate because you're not seeing Hillary supporters saying never Sanders, and likewise with the Sanders supporters saying never Clinton. Or if they break apart, is that? going to be healthy for the Republican Party? Like, is that the direction that, that the GOP wants to go into kind of a, a splintered group instead of unified? And then what does that mean for the future then? Yeah, but something you just said about you don't see a, a never Hillary movement. I'm not so sure I agree with that. I think a lot of Bernie people feel that this has been robbed. You know, they've been robbed here. You know, this, this whole process has been rigged for the Democrats. And I actually I have a great sympathy for them because – well, I don't think the Republican process is rigged, per se. The Democrat side, I think it absolutely is with the superdelegates. And so that frustration from Bernie Sanders supporters may cross over into a general election where they sit it out. If, or, or they vote for Trump if he's a nominee because they just decide it's, it's time to put a stake through the heart of the Clintons once and for all. Uh, Elizabeth Warren hasn't endorsed Hillary Clinton, which is very odd, but neither has Barack Obama, neither has Joe Biden. They've said nice things, but there is, there is a deep division in the Democratic Party between the Clintons and, and the rest of the party. They don't view them as progressives. They don't view them as, as, as good for the Democratic cause. So it's possible on the Democratic side, you may have millions of Bernie Sanders supporters who sit this one out and say, you know what, screw it. They robbed Bernie. They cheated Bernie. Superdelegates, it's not fair. That's a possibility that could happen as well. It's just not something the media talks about. You hear a lot about the never Trump. You hear a lot about the division in the Republican Party. You just don't hear enough media coverage of the split within the Democrats. And that's an interesting point, and I want to add on to that. I believe it was when former Governor Ed Rendell was on your program, and he, and he discussed that he thinks Senator Sanders might take this all the way to the convention. Do you see this as a possibility? 
No way. <laughs> You say no way. I say no way. I, I, but I, was, am I mistaken? Didn't you say Governor? Ren- I think Governor Rendell said that on your program, correct? Yeah. No, he did. You're out. You're 100 percent right. He did. He he thinks that there will be. In fact, he said there will absolutely be a contested convention in Philadelphia for the Democrats. So that see exactly. That's what he said. So, so that's my point. So do you see that happening? I understand that's Governor Rendell's sentiment, and we know how uh, Governor Rendell's been on the side of Secretary Clinton. Not only in this election, but back in 2008, he was uh, what? He was the head of the DNC. At the time, and he yeah, was also, right. uh, you know, really on Secretary Clinton's side. And for, you know, a prominent Democrat like Governor Rendell seeing that he thinks this could go to the convention, do you see it as a possibility then? I, I do. I really do. Wow. I, I think Bernie would be wise to think that if tomorrow he wakes up and decides that he's out or throws his support to Hillary Clinton, he's going to let down millions of people. He should go to the convention. He should fight this on the floor. As if you really want to capture this populist thing, then you have to do what Trump's doing, which is to, to, to rail against the establishment, which Bernie does, and then you've got to take it all the way to the floor if necessary to prove your point. And I think Bernie Sanders should do that. Now, will he do that? I, I, it's, hard, it's just so hard to say. He's going to have a bad night tonight, most likely. And how much money does he have? How many resources can he marshal to go all the way to the convention? But if I were betting, I'd say Bernie goes to the convention, puts up a fight, if nothing else, to command a giant primetime speech at the Democratic convention, which is a lot of power. And this revolution of his, he's not going to win this revolution, but he's setting the stage. Think about what Bernie Sanders has accomplished. We've made... We've gone from socialism being this dirty word that scared people to being an acceptable presidential candidate in the United States of America. Still scares me. People who are voting for a socialist. Yeah. I mean, I just think that this is this whole election on both sides. Donald Trump kind of touching the nerve on the Republican side and and Bernie Sanders kind of touching the other nerve on the Democratic side. What you know? I've often said on this program that I think Ted Cruz is the best person for the job on the GOP side to, to handle it. And I, 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 I wonder, because there is so much negativity surrounding his thing, people in Pennsylvania even thinking, there was an article on Billy Penn thinking he ran the most unfair campaign in, in Pennsylvania. What do you think of Ted Cruz? Do you think that he has too much negativity surrounding him going forward, and especially in the Senate, who people have said that they can't stand the guy? <laughs> I like a lot of what Ted Cruz stands for. I, I, I love the fact that he's a constitutional conservative. I love the fact that he argued the Heller decision before the United States Supreme Court. But the time is wrong. I think in politics, it's timing is everything. And, and in 2016, the message was not the Constitution. It wasn't uh, interventionalism. It, a lot of the issues Rand Paul talked about, Ted Cruz talked about, it just wasn't the time for that. This is a time for protectionism, anti-trade, and it's not the, the kind of thing that a free market classic conservative or libertarian is going to win on in this, in this cycle. So in this cycle right now, Ted Cruz's message was just off. It just was off. You know, that's what I think when they go back and write the book on why did, why did these other candidates not make it, who had a lot of talent and a, and a lot of political capital, it's just that their message was off. The, message, the voters wanted to hear, you're going to protect this country in, in the sense of that, that, that wall, that, that I think metaphorical wall of you're, you're going to pro- protectionism. And it's not something that conservatives stand for. Conservatives really don't stand for tariffs and for punishing countries and punishing private companies who move jobs overseas. Those are not conservative positions per se. And that's why I think that from this is just, this, this works for Donald Trump in 2016. Wouldn't it work for him in 2012? And who knows what 2020 will bring, but this is the time, this is the message. And I think just bringing up time, I, I, I think that that is, is something that's really interesting to consider. I've often said that Chris Christie, I feel like his time was in 2012, and now the ship has sailed, right. and, he was, and he was unable to garner above even like 3% at oftentimes. And I, I'm a Chris Christie fan. I think I think he's good. He's kind of got that brash, you know, attitude. You know, I'm not going to take any crap from anybody. But well, Very similar to Donald Trump's attitude. That's why when Chris Christie went out to endorse Donald Trump, I don't understand why that was such a shock to such an amount of people. And again, I'm not tooting my own, ho- or tooting my own horn here, and I don't know a whole lot about anything. But even I tweeted Congressman Brendan Boyle in my district, uh, I believe a week before uh, he announced, and I said, am I foolish to think that Chris Christie could endorse him just because 
I, I see the similarities in their personality. I just thought they were somewhat similar in, in that aspect. But I think you're right that Chris Christie's ship kind of sailed. And this just seems like the, the like you said, I guess all logic's out the window with this uh, current cycle. And this is, I guess, the perfect year for Donald Trump to possibly get in the nomination. Yeah, it's, it's, for Chris Christie, this was a smart political strategy. It was because he, you're right, his time was 2020, 2012, and that was his time, and he was part of the establishment lane in the Republican Party. I thought he was going to back Jeb just because his brother made him U.S. attorney for New Jersey. I thought he was loyal to the Bushes, but for Christie, he banked on the fact that Trump was probably going to go all the way. He, he's, Christie's very good at sensing the politics of the day, and he sensed it well, and it's going to pay him dividends. Because if Trump is elected president, Christie will be the United States attorney or attorney general, and uh, it'll be very good for Christie. And, and, and all the people that are mad at him for backing Trump will eventually probably come on board. Some will harbor resentment towards him. They say he's a sellout and that sort of thing, Meg Whitman and some other people. But in politics, people forget. You know, They want to be with the winner eventually, and so if Trump does become president, they're just going to want to be on the team. And uh, for Christie, it's, it gives him a lot of power and gives him a lot of capital. Yeah, I, I think that it would... It is a smart decision I see in, in, in his part. Um, I see where he's coming from on that front. I think a lot of people. I think I think they were angry. I think they some some thought that uh, maybe they would that he would go a different way. I didn't see him going to Marco Rubio after that debate performance where he just absolutely railed him for you know, the classic. Oh, here's the drive-by response. Oh, there he goes. He hits you with that twenty-second liner. Um, and so I didn't really see anybody other than Trump sharing some of the same perspectives.